everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dirt Nap City. We are here today, uh, well, not really here, we're both in separate places recording remotely. Thank goodness for technology, but how are you today, Alex? I'm doing great, Kelly. How are you? Very excited. This is a summer episode. It's going to be summer when this comes out. We're recording in the spring, but we're a little ahead with the recording at this point, which makes me really happy because I feel like I can spend more time doing research. And I did some serious research for today. Well, I can't wait. Now, when you say research, what, is that, what does that involve? Does that involve travel? Does it involve... Um, yes. Yes. Ac- actually, for real, this time, I did travel <laughs> for, for this relevance on this. No, 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 no. Wait till you hear uh, I read a book, a very long book, um, and then just throughout the entire time I was reading the book, I was cross-referencing things, like people's names that were mentioned in the book. I was oh, cross-referencing. Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to dive in. And Alex, I'm gonna, I, I pulled a play out of your old playbook. Hmm. Um, well, rather, than just, rather than just giving you, <laughs> you want to guess what that is? A riddle, right? Uh, a poem. Oh poem. wow! Great. Yeah, rather and and Chat GPT Bard, none of the AIs wrote this. I wrote this myself. I actually tried okay. to get the the AI poem sucked, so I wrote I wrote one myself. Good, but I will I will give you just a quick bit of no. I won't even tell you the birth and birth and death dates because I think it's better if I give you the um the poem. So listen all the way through, and I think by the end you'll be able to insert the last word of the poem for me. So, wow. so when I pause, that's where you say the word, that's where you make your guess. All right. <laughs> all right. It's a, this all is right, interactive. Yeah. All right. Sit back, young student, and I'll be your tutor. We'll learn of a man who was a magnificent suitor. His heart was afire with a great love for life, but the same was not true for his first, second, third, fourth, nor fifth wife. But he paid it no matter, and he went on his way, hunting and hawking and drinking all day. He quarreled with the Pope and the great King of France, and to ensure his succession, he left nothing to chance. He was a legend, a force, a game changer, and after today, no longer a stranger. For we will dive deep into his world of war, passion, and faith, and today get to know Henry VIII! Yes. Yes. Well done. Here, virtual high five. Boom. Uh, <laughs> you had, yeah. So, yeah, I was. I was hoping it wasn't Larry King. <laughs> that was. That was really close. We were almost going to do Larry King, but uh, no. Did you get that first line? Sit back, young student, and I'll be your tutor. Uh, yes. And that was the only part that didn't also apply to Larry King. Right. Right. All so the rest was, of it could have been Larry King. That, that was the differentiator. Yeah, the four or five wives. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so getting back to my point about doing some research, I I went to England recently. I actually was in London and Bath and uh, traveled around a little bit and took a few walking tours and uh, was very interesting to learn a lot a lot about their cathedrals um, on on these tours. But and then I read a book called uh, Henry the Eighth King and Court, and it is very long. And quite boring, most of it. It's a lot of lists, like listing different people in the court and different, um, you know, plots of land that he bought. But every so often, there were these great little stories in it, you know, about something that happened. And so I, I would jot those down as we went along. Let me tell you what I know. Okay. About six months ago, I saw the ninety-minute musical Six, which is a musical about about the his, wives, about the wives. So that's. A sum total of what I know about Henry VIII, but it was okay. entertaining. It was entertaining. I know that one of his wives sang like Beyonce, and another <laughs> one sang like Adele, and the other one was like a Nicki Minaj character. Right? Wait, so is this is this a live thing you saw, like at the theater? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Tuts yeah. or something? Uh, yeah, it, it was it was touring, but it's on Broadway right now. Okay. Um, and each one of his wives tells kind of their story uh, through their eyes. Um, about whether she was beheaded or, you know, divorced or whatever. And each wife sings in the style of a different contemporary artist. Like I saw, like I said, so they all kind of have their own personalities and their own. It's the whole thing is music. And yeah. Like, yeah. No, I didn't know, even know that existed. So pop diva kind of music, but it was, it was pretty entertaining. Okay. It's called six, six, right. About the six wives. Right. You know, the way that school children would remember the fates of the wives. Have you ever heard their nursery rhyme? 
Mm-mm. English school children. Uh, divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. That's that's in the movie. That's that's. I mean, in the play, that's the the main song. Oh, is divorced. and they each one of them says that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's it. Divorced, yeah, okay. beheaded, died. Well, divorced, apparently, that's survived. a pretty famous. Uh, wow, that's a pretty famous uh, rhyme in England. Divorced, right. beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. Yeah. So yeah, so you I mean, could have saved of... that whole book and the trip and all that if you just would have watched this ninety minute show. You could have been in and out. Well, I, I want to go see it now because I because I know a fair amount about all these ladies. <laughs> yeah, you'd probably dig it. Uh, as you probably know, um, he was uh, part of the House of Tudor. His name was Henry Tudor, um, and the house was sort of established during the time of the War of the Roses. Now that was during uh, two factions or two two families that were at war: the Lancasters and the Yorks. And Henry the Seventh, his father, Henry the Eighth's father actually was able to broker peace and end the War of the Roses. So, that so what was, year are we talking here? Uh, we're talking 14... Well, Henry was born in 1491, and I think he became king in 1509 Jeez. and was king from 1509 to 1547. So it called the Dark Ages? Is that the... Uh, well, no, this was medieval um, and kind of into the English Renaissance. Middle Ages. Yeah. call that? Yeah, okay. well, no, I mean, they said me- medieval, to, medieval, you know, okay. there, yeah. the, medieval was before this. It's interesting because Henry actually spanned a time when they were into the Renaissance, the English Renaissance, where art became a big thing, music became a big thing. Um, and really, he set the pattern, even though he's known as this ruthless killer who, you know, who did assassinate a lot of people or not assassinate, did um, kill a lot of people have have um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when when you kill somebody because they broke the law, um, execute. Yes, yeah, sorry, he executed. Uh, it said almost seventy thousand people is Ooh. is what is said, but that's no not proven. Anyway, um, that's what he's known for. But he actually was a big connoisseur and supporter of the arts. He was a big supporter of music. He was a big supporter of obviously the Reformation of the Church was a big thing under him. So so that's why there's a lot to talk about. There were five official monarchs of the Tudor reign. Uh, Henry VII, Henry VIII, Edward VI, who was Henry's son, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. And then there was also um, Jane, Lady Jane Grey, who was only, she was only um, uh, queen for a very brief period, like nine days before Mary killed her. This historian, John Guy, said in 1988, I thought this was a great quote, um, you know, despite all of his reputation, uh, Henry VIII, he said of him, England was economically healthier, more expansive, and more optimistic under the Tudors than any time since the Roman occupation. The seventy thousand people executed, notwithstanding, they might well, have a different. Well, this opinion. was this was he was talking about the Tudors as a whole, like from oh, a, yeah. all the way from Henry the Seventh to Elizabeth the First. Got it. So, like I said, he was king of England from fifteen oh nine to fifteen forty seven. His Older brother, Arthur, who was, you know, the oldest son of Henry VII, actually became king, but then died shortly after he was made king. Um, He died of the plague. They called it the sweating disease back then. The plague kind of like came in and out of this story many, many times. It It would happen during the certain times of year, and then it would dissipate, and then it would come back, and it would dissipate. It just was an ongoing thing. Henry was terrified of the plague. He, he really, you know, his brother died of it. And when his his brother died of it, he became in, king of England. Uh, but he really was not prepared because his father had always thought Arthur would be the king. So he never really prepared Henry to be king. Does that make sense? He was sort of a he yeah. Was despair. I, yeah, sure. I mean, Elizabeth uh, was the same, kind of the same way. But when he became king... He actually um, kind of rose to the occasion, and he ended up marrying his brother's widow, and that was uh, Catherine of Aragon, who was Spanish. But but before that, you know, when his uh, brother died, it was said that Henry was untrained in the exacting art of kingship, and so he really had to kind of figure things out because he hadn't been tra- trained as his brother had. He had some major accomplishments during his reign. He was known for his uh, radical changes to the English Constitution. He was the first to bring in the theory of divine right of kings, 
basically over papal supremacy because up until that point kings were below the pope in terms of the line to god but you know he said no kings are just as good or better than the pope when it comes to you know passing on the word of god he actually was a very religious person and very catholic so it was kind of interesting that he had this unique position where he founded the church of england you know broke away from the catholic church but still really liked a lot of the aspects of the catholic church you know the the bells and the tolls and the um you know the homilies and all the stuff you had to do as a catholic so he was in a weird position of of breaking with the catholic church but still really respecting and liking and and he prayed very often like he went to he went to mass all the time he prayed very often um one of the biggest things too in his reign was that before Henry VIII and and the Anglican Church, people were not allowed to read the Bible themselves. They had to listen to the Bible. Like the Bible wasn't really available, but everything was interpreted through priests. And so uh, it changed because Henry actually, um, after you know, after he broke from the church, put a copy of the English Bible, an English copy of a Bible, in all the churches around England, so anyone could read it. Gave people access to it, so they could kind of read it and make it their own, which was something that had never happened before. So he was a patron of the arts. He uh, loved sports. He loved hunting. He loved jousting. He loved archery. He loved tennis. He loved to sing. He loved uh, masquerades, all, all these kind of things. Um, most of that was in his younger life, because I think what we often see uh, visually of representation of Henry VIII is kind of a big, heavy, stern looking guy, you know, and, and apparently in his younger years, he wasn't like that. He became more and more like that as he got older, but he was very handsome. Always. There were lots of comments from other foreign dignitaries and ladies saying what a great looking guy he was. And he actually jousted, um, himself. Like he got on the horse and jousted as King for many years. As a matter of fact, he took several falls. So it was said that, um, some of the injuries he received during, um, these, jousting battles were um, contributed to his ailments in later years. He had headaches, he had sinus problems, he had gout uh, later in his, in his life. That was more dietary than anything else, I think. But, you know, you can imagine headaches and sinus problems being um, from shock, you know, hitting your head, that sort of thing. Yeah, now, it wasn't easy living back then. I mean, no, no. And, and of course, you know, he was the king, so he had the best situation possible. He had the best care, he had the best food. <laughs> Um, Although it was still pretty primitive medicine, but but can you imagine um, jousting like getting hit with a lance and falling off a horse? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and like I said, I'm doubt the, even the state of the art healthcare was probably not great. right. Right? No, no, it it wasn't great. Um, but do you know what they called uh, the place where they jousted? You know what that's called? I've been to medieval times, so <laughs> I should know this. <laughs> It's not, it's not called a chicken leg or a turkey leg. <laughs> it's a tilt yard. What's it called? A tilt yard. Tilt yard. Yeah. So tilting was another word for jousting. And, you know, you've heard tilting at windmills? No. Uh, Don Quixote? Yeah, I know Don Quixote. Well, that's that was what they said. He tilted at windmills. Um, oh, okay. It basically means to to try to fight a problem that doesn't exist. Is tilting oh, right, windmills. right. Yeah. Quick yeah, side. So, yeah. So so anyway, he was a big big sports guy. Um, he often arranged these masks, and a mask was sort of an improv improvisational performance where the courtiers as well as the royals would disguise themselves as different people and come in and sort of flirt with one another and dance, and then they would reveal who they were, and everybody would be like, "Oh, you're the king! <laughs> who knew?" <laughs> you know, I, I like that game. Well, and this this was all part this was all part of um, you know that that idea of courtly love that we talked about in the Valentine's episode. Um, they really got into courtly love in this book a lot about how essentially the knights would set out on adventures and do deeds to prove themselves worthy of a lady of the court. So, a lady of the court would sort of take the man as a as their their hero and then he would go out and go to battle or joust 
or you know fighting these combat things to prove his his courtly love and the knight in shining armor right yeah literally and and so it was sort of this whole thing between married people and unmarried people you know it was okay for a, a queen to for example have a knight who would um who would fight or um joust on her behalf even though she was married to the king that was acceptable because it was courtly love um you know what they called it in french they called it amour courtios or courtois maybe c-o-r so you are t-o-i-s maybe it's courtois yeah courtois Anyway, it was it was a very interesting thing because, you know, they talked a lot about the court itself and courtly love. Now, in addition to his sporting, he also was big into art. And, you know, I learned a new term. They talked a lot about how some of the rooms in the in the palaces and castles were grotesque, which, you know, I immediately thought of they smelled bad or they had problems. But you know where that comes from? Grotesque? Have you heard that term? No, I, I mean, yeah, I've heard the term grotesque. It's an Italian form of art that um, was originally discovered in grottos. So like in ancient Rome, there were buildings that were underground and rooms that were underground. And I guess they had forms of art, murals and paintings and such that were a certain style in those in those rooms that were in the grottos which was considered grotesque. Oh, and cool. so grotesque wasn't necessarily, we think of it today as disgusting or smelling bad or, or whatever. Back then it meant just in this form of this Italian art. But it probably was kind of creepy. Everything back then was creepy. Yeah, man. I, mean, come on. I mean, maybe it was like, would, would gargoyles be a part of that? Kind oh yeah. Of yeah. 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 So, very, I mean, very, very much. Um, these sort of, uh, fanciful, um, almost, uh, fantasy type, Images. Yeah, so there's probably a reason that it's now associated with, you know, being disgusting or gross. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it evolved over that. But that the original, when they talk about grotesque art, they're talking about that style of art. So during the summer, a lot of times as Henry was king, he initially he was not a very good ruler. Uh, I mean, imagine like if we had a president, Just this is just, just um, conjuncture here, but imagine we had a president that played golf all the time instead of rule, instead of actually doing work. Hypothetically. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, if we had a president like that, Henry was a little bit like that. He, instead of playing golf, he would go on progresses. And a progress was a traveling kind of group with all of his court and his uh, noblemen and his servants. I mean, it could be hundreds of people going from place to place city to city around the kingdom, and he would hunt. And that was his big thing, was going on these progresses during the summer. He enjoyed that more than anything, and he left he left the uh, work to his sergeants back at the back at the office, so to speak. It's like a dude's trip. Well, no, because there were there were ladies of the of the oh. court that went along on these progresses. Sometimes he would bring the queen. Um, but it was also, in addition to being a sort of relaxing thing for the king, because he loved to hunt, it was also an opportunity to show the kingdom the the magnificence of the royal court and the king. And magnificence was something, it was a word that was used a lot about how grand and great, and basically to fear them a little bit, you know, to understand that the the royals were real people who could come at any moment and and uh and stop you from doing things wrong in the kingdom. So that was well, a little bit of a PR move, these progresses. I wonder how much the average person back then knew about what was going on with the with the uh, royals. Well, not much, although, again, these progresses were designed to go to different parts of the country where the royals maybe were just a concept and they yeah. they became a real thing. So, But as, as I said, um, Catherine of Aragon was his first wife. She had formerly been married to his brother, Arthur. Uh, he died of course. And then Henry took over as king, married Catherine. And part of the reason they were married wasn't, um, you know, they there was a six year age difference. Catherine was older than him, but, but Henry was very young at the time. Part of the reason they got married was because of the alliance with Spain, with Spain. So Catherine was Spanish and her, her Spanish name was actually uh, Catalina. They were married in 1509 pretty much shortly after Henry became president, <laughs> shortly after Henry became <laughs> king <laughs> and went to play golf. Um, unfortunately, you know, part of the problem 
they had was that they never had a son. And so Catherine was pregnant numerous times. She had several miscarriages. She did have a daughter named Mary and, uh, and, and the King loved his daughter. You know, he, he said to have, uh, loved his children, but he became more and more frustrated because he didn't have an heir, right? Someone to take over for him. Now, back then there was a belief that if you, uh, sinned, God would punish you in various ways. And one of the ways, uh, Henry believed he was being punished was by not allowing he and Catherine to have a son together. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big, that's a big deal if you're a king. Yeah, it really was. Um, Henry did have an illegitimate son whose name was Henry Fitzroy. Now, Fitzroy actually means son of the king. He was born in 1519, 10 years after Henry became king. And it sort of proved to Henry that the problem with having a boy wasn't on his end. It was on Catherine's end, or at least in his mind. That's how he saw it to be. Henry Fitzroy, unfortunately, although he was made Duke of Richmond and, and lived a very, he was well taken care of. I guess back then, an illegitimate son wasn't wasn't hidden. You know, he's like, yeah, that's my illegitimate son. No biggie. Uh, Catherine, Catherine knew about him. You know, it was just, it was just a thing, but he couldn't be King. Uh, it would have been difficult. Pretty much anybody could be King with the right political cajoling, but, but they couldn't make that work. So, and also Henry Fitzroy had uh, tuberculosis and died at 17. So, you know, he, he couldn't be King because of that. Henry, Henry the eighth outlived him. So, you know, his thing was, as he was getting older, he was realizing, and, and with uh, Catherine being six years older than him, he was realizing that, you know, his, his odds of having a son were going down. And Catherine, you know, ha- continued to have miscarriages. Catherine was a very religious woman, uh, prayed a lot. And he and she and Henry actually got along quite well. Like they, they even to the point where Henry uh, sort of gave up on her decided it was time to get a divorce or, or to separate or actually in an annulment. He, he wanted to get the marriage annulled. And do you know why he said the marriage should be annulled? Why? Because she had been married to his brother. And she, oh. he said, he said, you know, somewhere in the Bible, it says you can't marry your brother's wife. Yeah. Well, she, she claimed all along that that marriage had never been consummated. And, uh, Scholars kind of believe her because Arthur was a sickly person and they were very young at that time. And, mm. uh, but you know, it's never proven one way or the other, but, uh, he decided he wanted an annulment and he asked the Pope and the Pope said, no, sorry, no deal, no dice. Um, and so that was kind of where the break with the church started to happen. And it was not only because of the annulment that he wanted, he also had been at war with France for a number of years, kind of off and on, like he'd be at war with them, then they'd have a big peace agreement for a while, then someone would break it and they would go back to war. And so he had spent a lot of money on the wars. He had spent a lot of money on his court. His court was very expensive, hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people in his care that he was paying. Uh, he also had a sort of appetite for property. He bought many, many houses and many, many places. All of that was causing financial problems for England. So by breaking from the church, he was able to take over the formerly Catholic churches and abbeys and monasteries in England and turn them into Anglican. Well, guess who was the head of the Anglican church? The king. Yeah, he was He was the king. And so he could make his own rules and take the money. And so a lot of those properties, he took money from those churches. Like some of those places had coffers and treasures and gold, and he took all that. For and he could make divorce legal. And yes, yes, it worked out in so many different ways. But he, he said it was an annulment. It was actually an annulment because she had been married to his brother. Interestingly, um, you know how long he was married to Catherine of Aragon? No. 24 years. Wow. So a long, wow. long, long marriage. Uh, even up to the point where he was courting Anne Berlin, his next wife, he um, still had dinner with Catherine. He still, like, they were on civil terms, and he did not press any sort of charges against her or try to make her out to be a bad person. He just said, look, you can't give me a son. Uh, you were married to my brother. I think it's time for us to move on. And so he fell in love with, and, and very deeply fell in love with one of um, 
uh, Catherine of Aragon's ladies in waiting, a woman named Anne Boleyn. Boleyn, right? Boleyn. Yes, that's right. That's right. Interesting though, if you say Anne Boleyn, it kind of sounds like a Jerry Springer show, doesn't it? <laughs> Anne Boleyn. <laughs> True. Da- down at the uh, down at the uh, Royal Trailer Park. Amber- no, you're right. It's Anne Boleyn. But, you know, said said fast enough, it sounds like Amber Lynn, which I thought was funny. Um, he became very, very enamored with her. Now, what do you know about Anne Boleyn? Um, that she was beheaded? Yes, she was one of the beheaded. She was from, um, you know, royal or, or high status family. And she was one of the ladies in waiting for, for Catherine of Aragon. So that's he met her actually when she was in the court serving his wife. And she was younger. She apparently wasn't that beautiful. So they, like, right. So they, I was just going to say, and I think that she was homely because in the, in the show, the aforementioned six, they make a big deal about how like he thought he was tricked that uh, he thought she was supposed to be pretty. And then when he finally saw no, her, no, 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 no. That, that is, that is a different wife. That is, oh. that's Anne of Cleves that you're talking oh, about. Man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so that did happen, but that was Anne of Cleves. We'll get Got to it. that in a minute. Got but um, Anne Berlin was was not exceptionally beautiful, at least. But Henry was in love with her. He was completely enamored with Anne Boleyn, uh, even while he was married to Catherine of Aragon. And he, at first, was giving her all kinds of property, all kinds of gold. You know what the big? You know what the big um, gift back then for for people to give each other was? Hmm. Cloth. Oh, imagine your wife walking in with a bolt of cloth and saying, you know, happy anniversary or Merry Christmas. <laughs> Just because you could make anything out of it. Or Yeah. Yeah. Cloth yeah. of gold, cloth of silk, cloth of, um, you know, all these all these rare. It was rare. Right. And so he gave um, Anne cloth of gold that she would make these beautiful dresses from. She was actually a seamstress as well. But ultimately, during that time period, he was able to. Um, get an annulment from Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon continued to live. You know, she was the mother of their daughter, Mary, and um, she was given a small settlement. And he was, um, Henry was taken aback and in love with Anne, Berl- Anne Boleyn. But eventually he kind of started to get sick of her because she was, a l- so Catherine of Aragon had been a very proper, pious lady, very quiet, very much, um, you know, at the time, knew her place as a woman. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that she was someone who stayed in the background, didn't argue, you know, just kind of like put up with Henry. Anne Boleyn was quite the opposite. She was younger. She was uh, a lot more sassy, a lot more willing to argue with Henry, a lot more to cause him grief and push back on him when she didn't like things. Sass was probably not a virtue in 16th century England. (laughs) No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. And so... He kind of got sick of her pretty quickly, actually. Um, you know, he 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 was only married to her for two two years and eleven months, so it wasn't very long before he was all right. Um, and and then she didn't deliver a son. She she also did not deliver a son. Um, she was a disappointment, and they they did have a daughter together, but no son. And so and that was actually Queen Elizabeth the first that. That was her daughter. Mm-hmm. And so um, he eventually said, you know what? I think you are treasonous. I think that you have uh, had many charges, um, done many things wrong. I think you have uh, treasoned against me. I think you have committed adultery. And he even accused her of incest within her family and said that she was uh, messing around with, I think it was her cousin, first cousin. And uh, said, this is all wrong. And so I am going to be rid of you. He had her arrested. And you know where they sent people back then when they were arrested waiting for trial? Like the dungeon? No, no. The Tower of London. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think I did know that. Yeah. If you went to the tower, you were you were pretty much done for. And, and you know, as I said, we, I had just, I've just been to London. We walked. We didn't tour it, but we walked outside of it. We walked same. across the bridge. And, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because there's lots of little plaques on the outside that I think now I would appreciate even more, you know, about who these people were because I didn't understand it at the time, you know, just that, like a month or two ago. But yeah, sent her to the tower and she was beheaded 
and uh, at that point, uh, he was able to continue his gallivanting with a woman named Jane Seymour. Now, Jane was also of uh, noble blood, and she... Speaking of incest, that always <laughs> corrects me. So he was mad that there was incest going on, but then he had to find another royal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was all very... I mean, incestuous is a, is a word. Now, one thing I want to say about Anne Boleyn before we move on from her is that in hindsight, she actually was given a lot of um, credit for her sass, I guess, you know, her outspokenness. And she's been called the most influential queen consort of England ever. And you know what a queen consort is? Yeah, I think Camilla is about to be a queen consort. Yes, it's yeah. it's a it's a woman who's married to a a, a current king, but so not the queen herself. She's the queen consort. Different, right. different title. So, um, so basically, she was considered the most influential uh, queen consort, and the reason that she's been bestowed this um, honor, or you know, why historians say this, is because she's the reason that Henry the Eighth uh, wanted to. She's one of the reasons. Uh, that Henry VIII wanted to annul his marriage, which led to the whole um, Reformation and you know independence of the Church of England. So, and and actually that wasn't that didn't the Reformation was a whole other thing going on with Luther, and uh, we're not going to get into too much of that. But it all kind of happened at the same time: the break from the Catholic Church and the Reformation, and Henry getting annulments and all that stuff. Is that the boring part of the book that you were talking about? <laughs> No, it just had too many lists. It was just list after list. So no. eventually, Henry, um, after he had chopped off Anne Boleyn's head, he married, uh, not very long after that, as a matter of fact, he married another woman named Jane Seymour, and third wife. And she actually was the only one to give him a son. So they had the son, King Edward VI, and... Well, future King Edward VI. They had a son named Edward together, and she actually uh, died of complications after childbirth. So she came in, fulfilled her role as the mother of his son, and then died. Jane Seymour hmm. did. Wow. Yeah, kind of, kind of the, I think the least detail I have on her. Um, but you know, she was younger. She was apparently quite beautiful, but um, she she was died pretty- in childbirth. You said. Two two weeks after from complications, oh, but basically so, probably complications or something yeah. from the childbirth. Yeah, so they were married for a year and four months, and then that is the woman. Now up comes the next wife, who you were mentioning earlier. She was somebody that he married sight unseen. Now after Jane Seymour died, you know he was looking for another wife, and he was told by some of his closest advisors that there was a very beautiful woman in Germany named Anne of Cleves, Anne von Cleve, who was the one that he thought would make a good marriage, not only because of her beauty, but also because of the political advantages of marrying a German woman of mm-hmm. noble birth. Basically, you know, that would build it, help build an alliance with Germany. So he sent for her. He had actually he had a um a portrait done of her and sent back. <laughs> it's like it's like the Snapchat of the time. And uh apparently the portrait wasn't bad. Apparently the portrait was also not very accurate, you know, when when she arrived there. Um yeah. she wasn't she was homely, like you said. Like a Tinder profile. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. It was like from you know, but she was actually pretty young. She she was she was uh I think she was only a teenager at that time. And so she um arrived in England on the 27th of December, 1539. And she was married uh, just like nine days later on January 6th, uh, 1540. But upon seeing her, he realized he actually was not attracted to her the moment he saw her and met her, but he also had already promised the, um, the, the, the powers that be in Germany that he would marry her and they had sent her and they had sent all of her, you know, everything that went along with her, which was servants. They had, she had German servants with her. She had money with her. She had gifts. It was too late to back out. So he went ahead and married her, uh, but he claimed that she had a foul smell. He didn't like the way she smelled. Did they mention that in the in six? No, they um, never did, but 
but there was a lot of him kind of getting mad that he that he like he didn't know she looked like that and she kind of tricked him but they didn't say anything about her smell it wasn't her that tricked him. You know, she, he he sent an envoy to go check her out. They he came back. Out on her, they came back and said, "Yeah, she's all good. She's good to go. Do it, man." And then and then when she got there, he did execute some people because of that. He he oh, was so yeah. so mad at some of his advisors for telling him that she was beautiful. And that's probably where the phrase "heads will roll" came from. <laughs> yes, yes. So <laughs> so for 6 months she was queen consort. He didn't have so one one way that a queen can actually or a queen consort can become a, a queen is to have a coronation. Well, they never had a coronation. He had intended to have a coronation for her. He did have a he did have a coronation for um, Anne Berlin, but he didn't have one for her. However, she's still considered a queen, you know, one of his wives. But ultimately, he had the marriage annulled because he never consummated it. He claimed to have never consummated it, and he said. Basically, I'm I'm going to annul this marriage. I am going to move on. I'm not attracted to you. It's not working out. But of all the wives, this was one of the ones that had the best outcome. Um, Anne of Cleves was given the title of the king's beloved sister. That was actually part of her official title after after they were annulled. She was given a generous financial settlement. She was allowed to remain in England. She was given um, land, and she ended up uh, living outliving the rest of Henry's wives. She actually, and she was very young, as I said. Yeah. I think he took pity on her. You know, he saw this poor girl who had been taken from from her country to marry the king, and then you know he he wasn't into her, and said, you know what? Here's here's a parting gift. You go your way, and I'll be kind to you. As a matter of fact, it's said that um, she actually would come to visit court sometimes afterward and they remained friends like they 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 he liked her better after he uh annulled her than he did when he was married to her uh okay that was anne of cleves on von cleve so of course next came uh and he was only married to her for six months and six days that's how long it lasted before he annulled. The next was Catherine Howard. He was actually only married to her for a very short time, too, uh, one year and six months. Now, Catherine Howard was um, a young woman. He wa- She was the daughter of Lord Edmund Howard and Joyce Culpepper, and she was a cousin of Anne Boleyn's. And so she was kind of, again, you know, in the family. She was too young to really be a leader or to really have any responsibility in court. So she basically just spent the days drinking, having fun, you know, living in, living the queen's life, but without any responsibility. And the king actually kind of got a little bit tired of that. A lot of the accusations that, that Henry VIII made of people in order to get rid of them were false, right? So Anne Boleyn, for example, probably didn't have incest, but Catherine did, um, by historians' accounts, have several affairs and had been a bit of a loose girl before uh, the king had oh. known her and had not disclosed that. Well, we so, can see where this is coming then. Yeah, yeah. And so um, she basically became, in his poor graces, he brought up charges against her, had her arrested, had her taken to the to the tower, and she was taken through what's called Trader's Gate, Trader's Gate at the tower. And she was uh, actually executed um, at the age of, I think, 17. She was, she was pretty young when she was executed. But she was someone who supposedly faced her execution with some of the most bravery at the time. She said, uh, according to popular folklore, her last words were, I die a queen but I would have rather died the wife of Culpepper. Now, Culpepper is the man she was having the affair with. So whether she actually said that or not, um, that's what it was said she said. That's what people told the king she said. And it was told to him to make him feel better. Like that, she, you know, she, she kind of defied him at the end and said, I should have just married that other guy. Um, she also, interestingly, before she was executed, she... Um, asked the 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 person uh, the executioner I guess 
to bring in the block that her head would be put on. And she actually practiced how she was going to put her head down and what she was going to say because she wanted to leave a good impression. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing that people know this. Like, it seems like this kind of history is really hard to document all this details that you're getting. Well, you know, it's interesting because I do think because he was king and and there was there was record keeping at this time. I mean, this was a long time ago, but they wrote stuff down. Like like I said, this book was a lot of lists. It was a lot of lists of what he spent his money on, like down to the down to the pound. And wow. the and so that's kind of where the book I thought strayed a little bit and had too much detail. But yeah. yeah. Down to the hay penny. They're not sure that she actually said those defiant words about, you know, I would have rather been the wife of Culpepper the man she had the affair with. But whether she did or not, that's what was reported to the king to make him feel better. That was kind so, of her vibe, even if she didn't say those words exactly. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, ultimately, they were they were trying to make the king feel justified for what he had done. Yeah. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I do think that Henry VIII had a conscience, despite what <laughs> has been um, portrayed about him. Now, after young Catherine Howard died, the next wife in line was also named Catherine. She was a bit older, a bit more mature, and she was actually someone who had been married before. She had been married uh, twice before as well. She ended up marrying four times. Henry was her third, but she outlived Henry. She she was his wife um, through his life. Her name was Catherine Parr. She lived from 1512 to 1548. So this is the third a- Catherine. Yeah, yeah, there were Catherine's, Marys. I mean, all the all the names in this book, the men's names and the women's Three names. Three Catherine's and two Anne's, basically. Or yep. Anna. So Catherine Parr was interesting because she knew how to play the game. Henry was a lot older at this point and settled down quite a bit. She took good care of Henry, and she actually seemed to have affection and love for him. This was when he started battling with headaches, sinus problems, gout. You know, he wasn't able to hunt like he had before. Um, so he really appreciated her like the fact that she would stay with him when he was holed up in bed and stuff like that she also was made a conscious effort to get to know and befriend his children so he had three children mary elizabeth and edward and uh, of course mary had come from his first wife catherine of aragon uh elizabeth had come from anne berlin and edward had come from jane seymour and catherine parr reached out to them and invited them for Christmas and gave them gifts and tried to be as motherly to them as possible. And that worked out well for her because when, when Henry VIII died, she was still alive and she was well taken care of. She, she actually, um, well respected in the kingdom under the, the reigns of her stepchildren, I guess. Catherine Parr was also an author, um, which was interesting. She was very religious I, I, you probably read these books because they're 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 really page turners. She had one called "The Lamentation of a Sinner." Oh you yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, and then this is my favorite of hers: "Prayers or Meditations Wherein the Mind Is Stirred Patiently to Suffer All Afflictions." <laughs> <laughs> probably could have used an editor on the title. <laughs> no, it was a hit. It was a big hit at the time. Believe it or not, people love that stuff. That was kind of prayers, meditations, psalms. Didn't have a big selection either back then. What What was interesting was she was actually, um, you know, she had Catholic influence and she had Protestant influence, but they walked this fine line because, like I said, Protestant and the Church of England weren't exactly the same thing. So if you lean too far in the tradition of Catholicism or too far in the sort of newer ideas of Protestantism, you could get in trouble. There were people in the court that hated you before it. You know, it was, it was very, very much a religious war between um, the old ways of doing things and the new ways of doing things. The Lamentations of a Sinner, that book actually caused anti-Protestant officials to say she was leaning too Protestant to have her arrested and, eventually like they wanted to have her killed just oh like gosh. the others but the king actually intervened and said no 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 she's she's good you know he talked to her and she said um you know she said my lord i apologize if i caused you grief i'm paraphrasing here but but um but i wrote this book with you in mind and your greatness and you know she ca- kind of spun it in a way that complimented the king and he accepted it and said she's good 
I feel like I'd always be walk. If I was this guy's wife, I'd always be walking on eggshells. Though. Oh, oh, just to well. So actually, there were some women who he was attracted to in court who kind of turned around and said, "No way, I'm, yeah. I'm not signing up for that." But yeah, yeah, it was interesting because I think you know she finally got him at an age when he had settled down a bit, and unfortunately, he was starting to um, slow down. He wasn't. You know, he wasn't as mobile as he had been. He had a lot of health problems, several cases where they thought he was going to die. And then he rallied. He ended up uh, going to war in France, like actually going over with the troops and, um, you know, was a little bit of a hindrance to them because he couldn't move very fast and he had to be lifted up onto his horse. Um, he got very heavy, like toward the end of his, you know, he didn't move much. And so therefore he ate more and it just kind of was a downward spiral. But uh, Catherine... Parr kind of figured him out and and figured out how to make him like her and not kill her. And she ended up outliving him. She she uh, outlived him to the point where she was under the reign of King Edward VI. That was her her stepson, you know, who who uh, had been born to Henry. And at age 35, she actually remarried another man, Thomas Seymour. And what was interesting about Seymour was he was the uncle of Edward the Sixth, uh, because yeah, he was related to Jane Seymour, right? Yeah, Jane yeah. Seymour. So cra- crazy how they all kind of got on, but yeah, she seriously. she unfortunately ended up dying because when she got remarried, she became pregnant, and she had never actually been pregnant before. Like I guess Henry at that point had kind of given up on another son, and so when Catherine Parr got pregnant, she died because of complications of childbirth. Well, it's interesting <clears throat> that this guy, I mean, he's very famous, but he's kind of defined by his wives. Like the, most of what you've been talking about was kind of his history through his wives. That's where we know him from. That's what this this musical was all about. The musical is interesting. It's kind of presented as each one of these divas is going to get up there and talk about who they, it's like a contest of who suffered the the worst. <laughs> right, right. Right. And um, it's interesting, though, how we kind of define this guy by his six wives. And that's the first thing we know. And as soon as in your poem, as soon as you talked about wives, one, two, three, four and five, it's exactly who I knew who, who you were talking about. And, and that's what's that's part of what I wanted to talk about here. And, you know, we've got only a little while left to finish. But, um, you know, he really was more than that. And, and um, he was somebody that historians believe really ushered in the modern age for England. You know, he, he promoted parliamentary government. He supported, um, the arts in a lasting way. He enhanced the standing of the monarchy through his magnificence and the way that, you know, he, he was very generous to a lot of people in the kingdom too. He gave money to people. Um, he kind of brought in the modern age from the medieval age, you know, and that's something that most people don't realize. They only think of his killing, but I also wanted to talk to you about some of the interesting things about the court life when when he was around. So, first of all, have you heard the term the royal we? I mean, it's when you when you say, you know, we don't we don't like that very much or we're just you you use, use that kind of uh you're talking about yourself but you're using the term we. But but do you know where that comes from? Oh, no, I don't. So, that was actually something called pluralis majesticus majesticus something like that in in latin um it dates back to the late 12th 12th century henry the second and it meant god and i so when you invoked the royal we as a king you were basically saying that you were speaking for god and for oh. the state so so the royal we was the ability for someone to refer to their connection with god and the fact that he and god were acting together mm. I don't really use that term. I don't really talk like that too much. Yeah, just, yeah. You we know, don't really you, talk. You, like you, that. you and God, um, privy chamber. You know what the privy chamber was? No, that was sort of the inner chamber of the court where only the higher ranking officials could go. There were layers of the court. It was almost like seats at a concert. You know, this was the front mm-hmm. row or backstage passes, essentially. Mm-hmm. The Lord Chamberlain was the highest ranking official in the royal household. But there were other there were other really great um, titles like the almoner. That was the guy who gave money to charity. Of course, the chancellors, the chaplains, the confessors, the door ward. The door ward was a guy who guarded the door. The falconer, 
Gentleman of the Bedchamber. And then this is one of my favorites here, Groom of the Stool. You know what Groom of the Stool was? Oh, no. I <laughs> <laughs> is, it, uh, is it what I think it is? Yes, but different. What do you think it is? I think it's a person that kind of cleans out the toilet. The flusher. That was actually the night soilman. So there was a night soilman who cleaned out the toilet. The groom of the stool was the person who was responsible for assisting the king in hygiene and excretion. Wiping his ass. It's unknown whether that actually happened or not, whether he did the wiping or whether the king did. But he was there when the man when the king was doing his thing. And and uh he was in charge of that. Well, and you know what? It was called groom of the stool because at the yeah. time, you know, you know, you hear of stool samples or a yeah, stool yeah, yeah, yeah. making a stool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because because they sat on a stool. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a stool with a pot under it. So groom of the stool. But here's Porcelain the thing: throne. you might not know is that the groom of the stool was actually one of the most powerful men in court. That Ugh. was a very high ranking official. Like groom of the stool could come out and tell other guys what to do, and they. I bet he did too. I yeah. bet if I had that job, I would be telling everybody. <laughs> I would be trying to throw my weight around every chance I could. So a few, a few more interesting little, um, little tidbits of that time. Uh, the king, as he got older, had to wear what were called gazers. Now, gazers are what they called spectacles or glasses. At the time, they didn't have the arms on them. They just pinched on your nose. They just kind of pinched on the top of the bridge of your nose and went out on the side. Yeah. So that's. That was- uh- and I doubt they were very accurate. A few other people that uh, I should mention: Thomas Woolsey. Have you ever heard of Thomas Woolsey? Yeah, that name sounds familiar. We, we could do we could do a whole thing about him, but he was basically a, a church, a Catholic bishop, who early in uh, Henry's life was very influential and kind of. Remember, I was saying how Henry didn't like he liked to go play golf or to hunt. Yeah, um, Thomas Woolsey was a guy that ran the ran the shop while the king was gone. Oh, okay. So to speak. But he actually eventually fell out of favor because he was a Catholic bishop and he became a cardinal. Well, he couldn't convince the Pope to, to allow the, the annulment. And so he got out of favor with uh, the king, was sent to the tower, but died on the way of natural causes. Hmm. Thomas Woolsey did. Um, he was also known as Alter Rex. You know what Alter Rex means? Like the substitute king? Yes, other king. So after Henry VIII died, his son, uh, Edward VI, was coronated. Now, he was. Um, this was said at his coronation, uh, the king is dead, long live the king. I've heard that phrase used before. Yeah. Have you mm-hmm. heard that before? Oh, yeah. I always thought it was a very odd phrase, you know, but now I kind of understand it, it a little bit It just means better. there's continuity, succession, we keep going. Yeah. He was not a very healthy child. Uh, Edward VI was not a very healthy child. He had a short reign. He had a lot of, because he was uh, pretty young, he was only nine years old when he was uh, coronated. He had a lot of assistance from other men, but he's basically said to have brought in the the sort of age of Protestantism. And he was really determined that there would not be a Catholic to take over his place when he died. And so he wrote a decree saying that Lady Jane Grey, who was a distant cousin, would be the next in line for the throne. And that is what happened when Edward VI died. Lady Jane Grey was pronounced queen. She was married at the time. She came to London, Queen Mary, Mary, uh, Mary, who was the first daughter, the oldest daughter from, um, from Catherine Aragon, came to town and had her executed um, after nine days of reign. I don't like all this execution. Yeah, and because of it, uh, Mary actually Mary actually continued the tradition of execution. Now, Mary was Catholic, and so there was a lot of, you know, as I said, Protestantism had kind of taken over, and so Mary had a lot of people executed in addition to her, her um, father, like Henry VIII had done. Uh, you know what her nickname became? Bloody Mary? Bloody Mary, yeah. I do like a Bloody Mary. <laughs> she basically um, wanted to take over... Everybody basically get rid of all the Protestantism, but the it was the genie was out of the bottle at that point, so there wasn't any possibility of that. After Mary was Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth was her half sister. She was the daughter of um, 
Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. And she was actually one of the first queens to be known for learning and wisdom. She was very popular, very capable, and she was respected and feared. She actually had some big military victories against the Spanish. And Elizabeth I was reigning when the first Virginia colony was founded in the New World. Wow. Yeah. Takes us back up to current times. Well, and and uh, she also was uh, around when Shakespeare was popular, and and she was um, she was a fan of Shakespeare. Oh, wow. Now she never married, and that kind of ended the uh, Tudor dynasty. Yeah, and I I don't know how they moved from one house to the other, but from the from the Tudors to the Windsors or whatever. I don't know how. Well, interestingly. Um, the Windsors, who I believe are the current royals, right? Right. Yeah. They they are distantly related to the Tudors by Henry the Eighth's sister Margaret. So Henry had a, a sister Mary, and he also had a daughter named Mary, and then he had a sister named Margaret. Margaret was the Queen of Scotland, and that is how the Windsors are related to uh, the Tudors. Okay. Okay. Through that. Didn't know that you're such an Anglophile. <laughs> well, like I said, this long. I think it was an audio book, and it was like 36 hours long. So oh it was it was uh, it was a lot. So I just want to close with a quote, and I thought this was a great quote about um, Henry VIII. Uh, it was from the biographer William Thomas. The king was undoubtedly the rarest man that lived in his time. I say not this to make him a god, nor in all his doings. I will not say that he had been a saint. He did many evil things, but not as a cruel tyrant or a hypocrite. I watch not where in all the histories I have read to find one king equal to him. Hmm. I don't know if you remember in Harry Potter, they were talking about Voldemort and they said he did uh, great things. He was a great wizard who did great things, evil things, but great things. You know, and that's Is that where kinda, it comes from. Yeah. I don't know. Well, actually, I mean, if you if you watched uh, Game of Thrones at all, like the whole, uh, I don't know if you watched it at all, but the the whole thing with the younger brother marrying the the bride of the king, the older brother who dies, like a lot of that uh, kind of matches up to Henry VIII. Ah, uh, well, you know, just like a lot of our residents of Dirt Nap City, people are complicated. You know, very true, and, and it's interesting because Henry VIII is sort of a caricature of who he actually was. You know, we all like to think of the guy with the big turkey leg at the Renaissance fair jousting and having people beheaded, but sure. He was Although it that. sounds like there was a lot more truth to that than uh, caricature. He was having people beheaded. He was he did have gout. He was overweight. He had somebody wipe his ass for him. <laughs> I mean, he was kind of the, the stereotypical king that we know of, right? But but if if that was a if that was a position in your household that that was that you, <laughs> all right. You have all right. <laughs> Can you have your own groom of the stool? But what we think of when we go, man, if I was king for the day, we're not thinking about King Charles. We're thinking about Henry the Eighth. Yeah, like the yeah. ultimate power. You can do whatever you want. Have anyone killed? Everybody's doing everything for you. It's just like a total life of hedonism and luxury and excess. Yeah, that's probably where we get that all from. As this clown. Yeah, no, very true. Most most famous king of of all. Well, um glad glad we were able to enjoy this time visiting our favorite place outside of Texas, Dirt Nap City. Any final words on Henry the 8th? No, I just I you know, I had mentioned that that uh that play. Um I don't know if you would like it or not. It's it's there's not a lot of acting. It's mostly singing and it's it's mostly like a pop divas but i i do have a list here if you want to hear like who what music comes from who yeah absolutely um, catherine of aragon is was like beyonce type because she was kind of the the one like you said that everybody respected and the older one and everybody kind of looked up to right and then anne boleyn was kind of the the cheeky one and and her music is more like miley cyrus okay uh, avril lavigne type of stuff uh Jane Seymour was is like uh, another diva, but like Adele and Sia and Celine Dion type of music. Uh, Anna of Cleves was like uh, she was kind of a rapper, and her music was more like Nicki Minaj, 
Rihanna type of uh, stuff. Okay. Um, and then Catherine Howard was uh, very like sexualized, like young and sexualized. So she huh. was more like Britney Spears, Ariana Grande type. Yeah. And then finally Catherine Parr, who was kind of classy and uh, went out uh, with music more like a Alicia Keys type, where it's just kind of and beautiful anthem anthemic voice. So it was kind of how they portrayed each one of these people. And then at the end, they kind of decide, well, wait, we don't need to talk about ourselves in terms of Henry the eighth. Um, we're individuals and we all had lives and we don't need, it was kind of a feminist take on, on the whole thing. You know, it was kind of a cheeky show, but it's currently, you know, showing in, in Broadway and West end and all that. So if you like the Henry the eighth stories, you probably dig the show. If you like pop music, you'll probably dig it, even if you don't know anything about it. But it's, right. it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that is uh, very much a modern take on it, you know, and and uh, it's kind of like the Schoolhouse Rock for today's world, right? It's, yeah, it's something that is going to get people to appreciate it. And, well, it's and learn uh, it. Hamilton started all this, right? Yeah, Hamilton started us like trying to trying to get our well, Schoolhouse Rock probably started it, right? But trying to get our history with the dose of. Uh, pop music and if the facts aren't all true well so what we're having a good time right 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 no that's <laughs> that's awesome well again alex i appreciate you uh sticking around and uh i hope everyone out there enjoyed this episode of uh dirt nap city about henry the eighth and we will see you next time we visit dirt nap city in about two weeks i'm henry the eighth i am henry the eighth i am i am Widow next door, she's been married seven times before, and everyone was an enemy. She wouldn't have a Willie or a Sam. No, Sam. I'm a eighth old man, I'm an arena. And a really eighth I am. Second verse, same as the first.